Good evening, everyone, and good morning to our friends on the other side of the globe, Pastor Caroline and Pastor Craig. We're just really enjoying this teaching so much, and only eternity can tell the impact of these teachings, Pastor Craig. Thank you so much. And um, friends, um, I would like to introduce Pastor Craig for, uh, you know, just uh, a moment, because we have some friends here who just joined tonight, Pastor Craig, if you don't mind. Oh. Okay, uh, Pastor good. Craig uh, is married to us, uh, uh, to Dorothy, and uh, they have been uh, ministers for so many years. I think they are the uh, the longest ministers here in our group tonight, uh, and they are they have been missionaries to different countries, including Ukraine. And uh, uh, um, his passion is to study the Word of God in a way like chewing it and then trying to get the meat out of this and share it to people in the way that people could understand and that the people would come to know the Lord as their savior and also that these people could uh, have a deeper understanding of the word of God. And that's what he is doing with us tonight and all the past sessions and the coming sessions so i could say that we are really a blessed bunch of people here that we could even have the time i mean to have the man of god a teacher of the word full of the word of god knowledge from god to teach us what a blessing it is say that pastor craig is living out of the word of god that he has been studying he is not just teaching but he is actually living and i think that makes him a very effective teacher preacher of the word wow what a blessing so folks again we are really privileged people that we pastor craig could set the time to teach us with this teachings that we are getting from him that he studied over the years and of course this is one of the product of his in-depth study of the word of god and so i hope um you really you will re really treasure uh this book and uh, it will help it will be a great help for us as we continue to to study together with him i think i can't understand it if i will do it myself pastor craig so thank you so much for spending this time to teach us it's really a great encouragement especially at this time very challenging time Thank you so much, and uh, I could say more. You said <laughs> enough. You said enough. More every session, but yes, we are we are really blessed more than I could even say. Have Pastor Craig teach us every session. Pastor Craig, go ahead. Thank you, Jocelyn. You've said enough. Actually, too much. Uh, I'm just delighted that we can be here and share with you, and and. Uh, open the word of God. Uh, before we start, let's just bow and pray and ask God to give us uh, understanding and direction. I, I want to have a voice that's anointed and you want to have a heart that's ready to receive the word. So Lord, we do pray that you'll guide us today as we look into your precious word. It is our bread of life. It's water to our souls. It's the strength that we need to carry on. And so Lord, I just pray that you'll continue to guide us as we look into your word and may today's time be meaningful and help us mature and grow and put our roots down even deeper in your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, what I want to do today is I, I want to start by having you open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, Hebrews is not always a very 
easy book to understand. Uh, but uh, we've been looking, if you look behind me here at this chart, that's, that's on, on, in your book, the front page and also inside. And we've been going through the various dispensations of time uh, since creation all the way through the cross. And we will be going through, this is the time zone we're living in now. We're going to go through into the second coming, talk about uh, the judgments and heaven and hell. And uh, we're going to take a tour of heaven before we finish this study. And so we're really going to have some great times looking into the future because the Bible ta talks about many, many things that are yet to happen. But anyway, we've been working our way through each of these time zones, and we have finally moved past the cross. Yesterday, I mean, last, uh, last session, we were talking about Jesus on the cross, and we especially highlighted Isaiah chapter 53, which said that he was wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes we are healed. And then after we, uh, uh, we, we talk about Jesus and the cross, I just want to talk now uh, for a few minutes about the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Everything before the cross is Old Testament. Jesus came and he started a new covenant. The word testament means uh, um, a promise or a, a will or um, a testimonial. Uh, and the, God dealt with people in a different way in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. So anyway, we are moving past that. There's a difference between the, the way God dealt with people in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's interesting because uh, I, I'm going to present it in, a, in this way, that there are, there's a major mountain in the Old Testament. And there's a major mountain in the New Testament. The major mountain or the focus of things in the Old Testament is Mount Sinai. Remember when Moses went up into Mount Sinai and he received the Ten Commandments and the, prom and, and, uh, the directions for worship? Uh, that was Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the great mountain is Mount Calvary, or it's often referred to as Mount Zion. Mount Zion. We talked one uh, week about how Zion is, is a reference to the place of God, the place where God dwells. And so uh, today I want to talk about two mountains. So now I'm going to go back to sharing the screen. And um, uh, here we go. All right. I'm uh, I'm calling this slideshow from the beginning. Here we are. Okay, I'm calling this two mountains. You see that? Okay, it's Hebrews chapter twelve. Okay, so let's get our Bibles out and look at Hebrews chapter twelve and read some, and then I will uh, go from there. Okay, Hebrews chapter twelve. I'm going to begin reading at verse 18. There's a lot more that we could be reading, but uh, let's just stay on this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. I'm going to read it, and then we'll talk about it. For you have not come to the mountain. There's the mountain. This is the Old Testament mountain now. The mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness, and tempest, and uh, again, this is um, Mount, Mount Sinai, um, and verse 19, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches that mountain, it should be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and, temp and, and, uh, and trembling. Okay, that's the Mount Sinai. Now we're in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 12. So don't, don't uh, 
don't get nervous because this okay. is heavy reading, but I'm going to explain it to you, okay? Right. Hebrews chapter 12, now verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. Okay, let's go back to verse 18. You have not come to Mount, Mount uh, Sinai, but you have come to Mount Zion. So that's verse 22. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits made of, of men made perfect. Um, uh, verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Okay, that's a heavy scripture to read. But here's here are the two mountains. The first mountain uh, is, um, let's see now, Mount Sinai. You see that? Verses 18 to 21 refer to Mount Sinai. The second mountain is Mount Zion. It says in verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, which is Calvary. That's the place where Jesus, of course, uh, gave his life, and this changed everything. I'm so glad I don't live in the Old Testament. I live in the New Testament. I live under Mount Zion and the benefits of Mount Zion. Okay, so let's look, let's look at these two um, um, mountains and see the difference between living in the Old Testament under Mount Sinai's rules or living in the New Testament where we are now under the rule of Jesus who, who uh, paid the price at Calvary. All right, let's go now, these two mountains. Let's look at the contrast between Mount Sinai and Mount Calvary. All right, first of all, we... we discover, as I've just said, like Mount Sinai is life in the Old Testament. As if I was living in the Old Testament, that's what Mount Sinai was all about. And they lived under all the rules that Moses received at Mount Sinai. I'll tell you, that was quite a way to live because everything was about rules. But now we live in the New Testament. And I'm so glad I am a New Testament Christian, and you are a New Testament Christian, a New Testament believer. We don't live under the Old Testament. We live under the New Testament. Okay, so what's the difference? Let's look at the next one. The Old Testament, Mount Sinai, is about law. It's about law. There's all kinds of laws, commandments, do this and don't do that and all that stuff. That's with the Old Testament. The New Testament is about grace. Oh, and we talked about grace last week and how wonderful it is to live under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, when we look at that uh, circle six on your chart of the different ages, that is that is that's the chart we're that's the age we're living in now. It's called the age of grace. Number five is the age of law, but we are living in the age of grace. And we talked about grace, how grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, how grace is all about getting more than we ever would have deserved. It's more than just being forgiven. We are given heaven. We're a child of God. We inherit the most wonderful eternity you could ever imagine. That's God's grace. So we live under God's grace. And even now, he forgives us our sins. We don't have to be paying the penalty for our sins. But He for, that's grace. Okay, so let's go to another one now. Under Mount Sinai, 
we're sinners. No, the, 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 let's do it again. The law is about God's holiness and his purity and his perfection. That's the law because that's that's what Mount Sinai is about the law. And we learn about, it's not all negative because we do learn about God's holiness, his purity, his perfect. In fact, God is so holy. What we read in Hebrews is don't let anything unclean touch this mountain because if anything touches this mountain it'll be killed that's how sacred god's holiness and purity and perfection whoa that's amazing but mount sinai mount calvary is about god's love and about his mercy and about his forgiveness you see there's a big difference there we don't we don't read so much about mercy in the Old Testament. It's judgment. And God, uh, God uh, deals very sternly with sin. Sometimes we read the old stories, the Old Testament stories, and we think, wow, God was so strict and so severe with sinners in the Old Testament. Remember uh, the people that brought the woman to Jesus who had committed adultery? And they said the Old Testament law says that she should be stoned. And you see, that is the law because she broke the purity and holiness of God. But Jesus said, now, now we move into the New Testament. He said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he said to her, is anyone condemning you? And she said, I don't see any of my accusers here. Any, they've all gone. And how wonderful it is. See, that's the New Testament living. That's why John 3 and 17 says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, oh, but that all the world through him would be saved. And so there's a huge difference between these two mountains. Let's look at another distant, uh, uh, difference. Under Mount Sinai, God is sinless. He's pure. We are the ones that are sinners, and we see God's holiness and his purity, and uh, we realize that we just don't measure up. But under Mount Zion, look at this. Jesus becomes sin. In other words, God, who is sinless, becomes sin so that we can be sinless. Oh, that is amazing grace to me. So we are made perfect before God because of what Jesus did. He took our sins. The Bible said he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. That is a wonderful thing. Okay, let's look at one more. Under the law, or Mount Sinai, um, the law hates sin. And demands a blood sacrifice. An innocent lamb has to be killed in order to pay the penalty. That, and so in the Old Testament, they were killing animals time and time and time again, over and over. They were offering sacrifices uh, because blood had to be shed. An innocent lamb or an innocent animal had to be shed. Uh, his blood had to be shed. But the blood of an animal wasn't really sufficient to permanently take away sin. It was just uh, something that they had to do that was a symbol of something better yet to come. Well, something better did come. Jesus came. In the Old Testament, the law hates sin, but Jesus loves sinners. And so he became the Lamb of God to rescue us from sin's death. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, you can even say praise the Lord there if you want, because God has been so good in putting praise our sin on Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Jesus has taken our sin. He is the Lamb of God. Remember when John the Baptist was introducing Jesus? He said, behold the Lamb of God. That word lamb shows up in the in all through the New Testament, and especially in the book of Revelation, in heaven, Jesus is still called the Lamb of God, 
we'll never forget that he is the one who ultimately took our sins upon himself and shed his blood. Well, let's look at another difference between these two mountains. In Mount Sinai, we see the law condemns sin. Of course it does. And it says, I am guilty. But under Calvary, Jesus rescues sinners. And now I can say, I am set free. I am justified. I like that word justified because it's kind of a theological word. But what it really means is, I am just as if I'd never sinned. In other words, God wipes out the sins. He doesn't hold it against us. Sometimes, you know, when, when uh, people forget, uh, forgive other people, they'll say, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget it. You know, well, God doesn't do that to us. God forgives us and he forgets it. And when we stand before him, we, it's just as if we had never sinned. We are pure and we are not guilty anymore. We have been rescued. We're set free. That is a wonderful difference between living under Mount Sinai or Mount Calvary, Mount Zion. Whoa. Okay, let's see another difference. Um, another difference is that uh, in Mount Sinai, the, we, we've um, said this, that the law puts judgment on us. We're the ones that have to pay the penalty for our own sins under judgment. The soul that sinneth, it will die. But Jesus is the one under grace. God puts God's judgment on Jesus, not on us. Jesus took God's judgment, and that's why he died. You see, when, when, when we talk about the, the cross of Jesus and the death of Jesus, it's more than symbolic. Some people don't understand the importance of the cross of Jesus, of the sacrifice that he made. Some people just say, oh, yeah, he died, and then he rose again. Uh, and they they put the cross up as a as a, a symbol of Christianity or something, but they don't understand the the depth of judgment that came upon. Think of the wicked sins that we've heard about, or that we've even committed, or the dastardly horrible things that have been done in 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 through history. Jesus took all that on Himself. He became sin, and God's judgment was put on Jesus, and taken, God's judgment was taken off us and put on Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be able to say? Oh, wow. Well, one more thing. Under Mount Sinai, we get a list of rules. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do this, uh, what we can do, what, what we it, it's, it's do this and do that and do the other. And that's why a lot of uh, religions um, are about works, what we have to do to gain God's favor. That's under the law. But really, under grace, it's different. We get the free gift. We don't get a bunch of rules. We get, instead of do, it's done. Jesus has paid the penalty. And so we receive his gift of eternal life that is completely paid for. Oh, that's just really, really wonderful to me. Okay, another thing about these two mountains, we read it in Hebrews, and we, if we went back into the uh, Old Testament, people were not allowed to come near that mountain. Don't touch this mountain. Let's look at uh, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And uh, verse 18. Sorry here. Exodus 20 and 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us, and we'll hear, but don't let God speak to us. 
uh, this, we, lest we die. Like this is this we can't even come near this mountain. And God warned them, don't touch this mountain. But look at this Mount Calvary. Look at the difference. We're to come. We're invited to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may be able to obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. So says Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. So in the Old Testament mountain, you don't come near that. It's, it's untouchable. But the New Testament mountain, we come boldly. We say, oh, thank you, Jesus. We fall at the feet of Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus, for being the sacrifice for our sins. And not only that, for inviting us. I don't need to creep up and, and sneak up into the presence of God and hope that uh, he's not going to send me away. That's not it at all. I can come to the Lord and know that he will receive me right away. I come to Jesus and know he says, come unto me. That word come, that's a word, that's a good study in itself. Uh, I just like that word come, come unto me. Remember Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And remember when, uh, when Jesus was walking on the water and Peter uh, was in the boat and he said, Jesus, if that's really you, bid me come. And Jesus just said one word come, come. But Jesus still has his hands open to us. Remember when they rebuked the little children for coming to Jesus, Jesus said, let them come, let them come to me, come. And we are allowed to come boldly to the throne of grace. That is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, aspect of Mount Calvary. Here's another one. We're almost at the end. There's a, so many things we could say. But when we look at Mount Calvary, we uh, Mount Zion, we realize that because of God's holiness, 3,000 people died on the first day of the law under God's judgment. Uh, Exodus 32 and verse 28. Exodus 32 and verse 28. It, it, it says, um, so the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. They were the ones that uh, were worshiping the golden calf and were rebelling against God. And because of that, death hit the camp, and 3,000 died. But look at the first day of the church. 3,000 were saved. On the first day of the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. What a contrast that is between the mountain in the Old Testament and the mountain in the New Testament, Mount Calvary. And finally, here's the last one. Under Mount Sinai in the Old Testament, I can't be perfect. I just can't keep the law. I can't. The, the Bible says if we offend in one aspect of the law, we, we're guilty of everything. There's no one that is pure like that. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. And so, really, that's bad news for me. Under Mount Zion, or Mount Sinai, I mean, uh, under the Old Testament law, I can't be perfect. I'm just not. It's bad news for me. I'm a failure. I'm doomed to die. I'm under the penalty of death. And so there's fear, there's separation. Uh, I can't feel uh, comfortable in God's presence because I'm a sinner. I know that. But look at Mount Calvary. Oh, Jesus took my place. Now, instead of bad news for me, that's good news for me. I'm forgiven. I have eternal life. I have joy. I'm clean. I'm adopted. I remember uh, at a youth camp one time, a, a young lady came to the Lord Jesus. I don't know what her background was, but she had done some very bad things in her past. And she came to the Lord Jesus, and she gave her, her heart to Jesus, and she was saved, born again. 
And I, I remember saying to her, boy, you look different today. How do you feel? And she used one word that was very interesting. She just took a great big uh, sigh and she said, I feel clean. Oh, what a word. I feel clean, she said. And that is a wonderful way to be able to come to Jesus. You don't want to come to Jesus if you feel dirty, but Jesus took the dirt. He died in my place. And that's good news for me. I'm forgiven. I have eternal life. I'm adopted into the family of God. I'm a child of God. So that's the difference between these two mountains. That's amazing. I'm going to go through them once again, just, um, just to um, uh, review very quickly. I won't to take a long time, but just in case you wanted to catch something that I ran past, there's Mount Sinai in the Old Testament, Mount Calvary in the New Testament. Okay, in Mount Sinai, that's life in the Old. Life in the New Testament is Mount Calvary. In Mount Sinai, it's about the law. Mount Sion is about grace. Mount Sinai, the law is about God's holiness. We learn about God in the Old Testament. And, but, he's so holy. But now, Calvary is about God's love and his grace and his mercy. How wonderful that is. So now, in Mount Sinai, God is sinless. We see his purity, and we realize how sinful we are. But now Jesus becomes sin. God, who is sinless, becomes sin. We who are sinners become sinless. Oh, that's amazing to me. Okay, under Mount Sinai, the law hates sin. It demands a blood sacrifice. God demanded right from the very beginning. Remember Adam and Eve? They put fig leaves over their nakedness. But God is the one who gave them animal skins, which means God shed the first blood of an innocent animal to cover the nakedness of, of Adam and Eve. So our sins are covered by the shedding of the innocent blood. And that's Jesus. Jesus loves sinners. He's the Lamb of God who rescued us from sin's death. Another one is the law condemns sin. I'm guilty under the law, that's for sure. But under grace, under Mount Calvary, I'm set free. I've made just as if I had never sinned. That's amazing to me. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us says uh first john chapter 9 and or chapter 1 and verse 9 it cleanses us from all sin it doesn't say from some sin it says from all sin praise the lord mount sinai the law puts god's judgment on us we're sinners but god's grace puts judgment on jesus how wonderful that he took my place he died in my place. In Mount Sinai, we get a whole list of what we have to do and don't do in order to uh, be right with God. There's only one thing you need to do under grace, and that is receive Jesus and receive the free gift. First, or John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Okay, so Mount Sinai, don't touch this mountain. It's untouchable. It's so holy. People stood afar off and they were afraid to come near. But under grace, we're called to come boldly before God's throne of grace. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we can come before God's throne and be uh, received with love and tenderness and god doesn't say well look at i i'm going to remind you of what you what did you do that for and why did you do that and yeah and, and i'm going to remind you of how bad you were god doesn't do any of that he buries it he forgives it it's over and it's the throne of god's grace and under mount sinai 
3,000 died that day, or, or right at the beginning of the law. But at the beginning of grace, 3,000 were saved on the first day of the church. What an awesome contrast. And I think the Bible points out that number just to show the contrast. Under the, um, uh, the law, it's bad news for me. I can't live that way. I can't be perfect. No one can keep every part of the law. But under grace, that's good news for me. Good news. Jesus has forgiven. He set me free. I have eternal life. I can live a joyful, clean life because I've been adopted into God's family. So I hope that little study has helped us understand what could have been a very uh, uh, heavy and difficult uh, verse to see in um, in uh, the book of uh, of revelation um okay so i'm going to um let's see i'm going to move back into just a minute how do i get out of this now um just oh you want to not share just turn your share page share off okay stop share yeah yeah is that it now you're good okay good Good, good. Okay, that's that's what I just want to stop. Now, before I continue, does that help you understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between law and grace? I, I just think it's marvelous to think that we are living in the age of grace. How good God is to give us his son, Jesus Christ, and to receive us into his family. So there's a huge contrast, and there's many verses that you could find on your own, uh, I'm sure, as you study those two mountains. Okay, I'm going to move into something now a little different, uh, and because we're moving now into this age of grace, and we are given the, the story of Jesus in the New Testament, and the story of Jesus is... Um, uh, is written in the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the story of Jesus is really written through the whole Bible. And I think one of the things that I want to get across as we're studying all these different weeks, and I think you've heard me say this more than once, is, is that Jesus is at the center of everything. No matter where you open the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, Jesus is at the center. And he wants to be at the center of your life and of my life. I remember talking to my next door neighbor in another house where I lived, not here, but somewhere else. And he was Buddhist. And um, uh, he, he said to me, uh, you know, we were talking, he was a fine young man, a, teenage boy and he used to help me in my garden and things and so we had some really good visits and good chats and he said I believe in Jesus I'm Buddhist but he said I believe in Jesus I said oh I know you do I know you believe in Jesus but I said here's the difference between you and me and I said the difference is that as a Buddhist you believe in Jesus but you also believe in about a hundred other gods well, he smiled. He said, well, yeah, that's kind of right. And I said, Jesus isn't one of a hundred other gods. Jesus is only the only God, the only true God. And rather than being inclusive, where I include every God that there is, Jesus is exclusive. There's no other God except him. Jesus has to be at the center of my life. Jesus doesn't want to be just one of many. In, um, in Canada, and maybe in Ukraine, I don't, or, or in the Philippines, um, watch this. Um, we, one of our great desserts is a pie. You know what a pie is? It's a big circle like this, and it's, it's covered with a nice uh, crust, but inside the pie, are, uh, it might be an apple pie or cherry pie or blueberries or some kind of berries. And there's 
there's berries in the in the pie, okay? And so the pie is filled with all kinds of wonderful fruits. And so then what we do is when uh, dinner time comes, we uh, we cut the pie up and we uh, divide the pie amongst our guests like this, and we all get we all get a piece of pie. And it's wonderful. Sometimes we serve ice cream with the pie. And so here's the way some people come to God. They say, God, I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to give a piece of my pie to Jesus. I'm going to let Jesus be a, a piece of my life. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. I'm going to try to do nice things to people. And so they feel good about letting Jesus be a piece of the pie of their life. And Jesus said, I don't want to be a piece of the pie of your life. I want to be the filling in the pie so that no matter where you cut the pie, I'm there. Some people say, well, Jesus is important because I go to church on Sunday, or he's important uh, when I... Uh, when I pray and when I'm in trouble, I, uh, that's when I believe in Jesus. But when I go to work, uh, he's not part of my work, and he's not part of my school, and he's not part of my family. Uh, I've given him Sundays. He's got one piece of the pie. Jesus said, no, 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 no. I want to be not a piece of the pie. I want the filling. I want to be the filling right in the pie so that I want to be, I want to be the center of your family, of your work, of your thoughts, of your of your uh, uh, secular and 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 uh, uh, extra things that you do just for fun, and he's I I just want to be everywhere that your life is. I want to be the center of your life, and that's the difference between being a Christian and just um, having Christianity as a religion. Christ, Jesus is not a religion. Christianity, Jesus didn't come to start a religion. Jesus came to bring us into a relationship with God. And so that's a, that's a really important thing. Every religion in the world is based on what we do. Christianity is based on God's grace and putting Jesus at the center of everything. And so now we, I want to go into another study and I'm going to go back if, uh, if Carolyn can give me the screen again. You have it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go, oh, just a second here to another, um, another study here. I want to uh, study the four Gospels, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to give uh, just a little insight uh, of these Gospels because, um, just a second here, let me, there we are, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I, I just want to maybe help you understand um, the difference between these first four books of the New Testament that are all about Jesus. First of all, the word gospel means good news. That really is literally the meaning of the word gospel, good news. And of course, this is the good news about Jesus. It's a good news about salvation. It's a good news that, uh, I mean, we can think of a, of a long list of good news, good news that I'm forgiven of sins, that I re can receive eternal life, that I have Jesus as my daily companion. There's tons of, of good news um, stories that, we, uh, that the gospel brings to us. And so the word gospel means good news. Um, but when we say there are four gospels, we use the term the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark. But in, in reality, there's really only one story. There's four writers but one good news story. You see the difference there? The good news story is all about Jesus. 
So rather than four different stories that are different, they're, they're the same. Um, they are talking about Jesus. Now, it's interesting when we see this uh, and read the Gospels that there are some things that they don't tell us about Jesus. The Bible doesn't try to tell us everything about everything. We said that when we were looking at our chart in the first place, that our chart, um, our chart isn't about everything that happened um, in, um, that, that everything happened in the past. We don't understand when, uh, when heaven began and all those things. The Bible doesn't try to tell us everything about everything. And, but it gives us the highlights about man. The Bible is about man and our redemption, our fall and our redemption. And so when we read the Gospels, it's, it's not telling us everything about Jesus. Um, just a second now. Uh, there are some things that we don't know, okay? We do know that Jesus came into the world to rescue us, to give us eternal life. But we don't know... For instance, we don't know how tall Jesus was. We don't know what color of his hair was his hair or his eyes. We don't what we don't know his favorite foods or uh, did he have any hobbies or did he play sports as a child? Um, how did he get his formal education? Did he have any uh, pets? Uh, uh, what about his family, uh, his brothers and sisters? We know some things about his brothers and sisters, but not a lot. Uh, what did his home look like? What kind of, uh, of clothes did he wear? We don't know, you know, a lot of things. And those things don't even matter. The Bible just tells us some very important things that we need to know. And so there are some things that we do know about Jesus. We know that Jesus never sinned. We know that never once in his life did he ever, ever sin. Uh, he he didn't fight with his siblings, with his brothers and sisters. Um, he didn't cause any heartache to his parents, to his mother. We know that he lived in submission to his parents. Luke chapter 2 and 51 tells us that. So there are some things that we don't know and, and other things that we do know about Jesus. However, this is interesting. Um, why do we need four Gospels then? If, we're, if it's going to be the story of Jesus, why don't we just have one Gospel at the first? Why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Um, well, that's an interesting question. But you know that if you go to court and there's been uh, an issue that you need people to testify about, <coughs> They, they don't just call one witness, they call several because they all have their own perspective, perspective on uh, what happened. The, the most important thing to know about Jesus um, is his character. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each paint their own picture of Jesus. Each picture shows a different angle. It's almost like you were walking around a uh, a building, and each told their their picture, their their uh, view of what they saw. And uh, after you put it all together, you get uh, a, a good uh, portrait of, of Jesus. And so um, it's not that the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all got together and said, "Well, let's uh, let's write." about Jesus, and okay, Matthew, you write this, and Mark, you write that, and Luke, uh, you, you write what, uh, what Matthew might leave out, and it wasn't anything like that at all. It's almost like um, in Genesis chapter 2, way back in the Old Testament, it talks about a river that goes out of Eden, the Garden of Eden, to water the whole world, and, uh, and that the river turned in the main river turned into four rivers well that's kind of like the gospel it's like uh, um the the gospel i would say it's like a quartet um that have one song uh they're they're four singers but 
it's only one song and they're, they're all they're singing different parts and they're blending their voices and they're singing in perfect harmony they're not contradicting each other but the song is very clear and the song is about Jesus um, uh, I like that there's the, the the quartet singing about Jesus and each with their own part okay so now let's look at the four Gospels in a different way. Did you know that in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 10, Ezekiel has a vision. And he sees in the vision a lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. Hmm, interesting. Then when we look at the book of Revelation, we see those same figures. Revelation 4, verses 6 and 7, we see a lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. Very interesting. Now, what about the lion? Let's just talk about the lion for a second. The lion is a symbol of a strong ruler, a king. That's the lion. Man, of course, is a symbol of intelligence and understanding. Someone that knows us. We have an expression that says it takes one to know one. It takes a man to know a man. It takes a woman to know a woman. Uh, and so uh, that's a man. What about an ox? An ox is a symbol of humble service. The ox was a worker, humble service. But then the eagle, well, that's a symbol of the heavenlies, of divine, soaring in the skies. That's the eagle. Well, that's interesting. Because when you see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see these four figures about Jesus, a lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. Not quite in that order, but I'll show you. Matthew shows Jesus as the lion. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Let's look at Matthew, the way it begins, the very beginning, the first verse of Matthew, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, this is about Jesus. His, his name comes first. The son of David. What do we know about David? He was Israel's greatest king. And so now we're telling that Jesus is a king. But then the son David was the son of Abraham, or an ancestor of Abraham. So that means, who's Abraham? Well, he's the father of the Jews. So basically, the very first thing we see in the very first book or first verse of the, of the first gospel is that Jesus is the king of the Jews. And throughout the gospel of Matthew, we read about his kingship. And it's interesting because when Matthew talks about his birth, who does he have come to worship Jesus? Does Matthew talk about the shepherds? No, he talks about the kings that come, the wise men that come and bring their gifts before the Lord Jesus. And so Matthew tells the story of Jesus as a king. And that's right away in the very first chapter of Matthew. Oh, that's amazing. And so that's Matthew. He shows, and throughout the book of Matthew, you see Jesus as a king. Then we go to the book of Mark. In Mark, we see he portrays Jesus as a humble servant. Oh, that's interesting to me. I'll tell you why it's interesting. Because the ox is the, is the, uh, uh, the symbol of service. And... Uh, the ox represents uh, patience and labor and working. And 
uh, by the time we read the very first chapter of Mark, um, Jesus has been busy at work in many different ways. Right in the first chapter, he's preaching, he's praying, he's casting out evil, de evil de uh, demons, he's calling his disciples, he's cleansing lepers. That's in the very first chapter of Mark. Jesus gets to work. Servants have work to do. And one of the key words in the book of Mark is immediately or straightway. That's used 43 times in the book of Mark because servants get to work right away. They don't sit around. They get to work. And that is one of the key words in the book of Mark. And Another thing I observe in the book of Mark, in the book of Matthew, we get a genealogy that, uh, that leads back to Abraham and David. But in, in the book of Luke, we get a genealogy too. But in the book of, uh, like we see the, the fathers and the, the, the sons, and we go back actually in Luke right back to Adam. But in Mark, there's no genealogy at all. Uh, why? Well, because Jesus is a servant, and you don't have to, you don't have to show the heritage of a servant. Uh, the pedigree of a servant isn't important, and so that's not mentioned in Mark at all. And when it comes to Jesus preaching, everything in Mark is abbreviated. The emphasis is on not so much what Jesus said as to what he does, and that's why Mark's gospel is really the shortest gospel of all. Jesus' sermons and his conversations in Mark, they're recorded in the other gospels too, uh, some of them, but they're always scaled down in the book of Mark. They're not as abundant as in the other gospels. So you see, Matthew shows Jesus as a king. That's the lion, the king of the Jews. Mark shows Jesus as a humble servant. That's the ox. And then we see Luke, Luke shows Jesus as the son of man. That's interesting. Remember, Jesus, uh, Luke was a doctor. And um, he, he actually traveled with the Apostle Paul on uh, some of his missionary travels. I think he was there to help Paul when he was beaten and helped him <coughs> heal of the wounds of the, of the, uh, the cuttings and the bruises that he received when he was... Uh, um, attacked by people, but that's the story of Luke. Luke is a doctor, and so even at the beginning of Luke's gospel, he takes the time to mention John the Baptist, and uh, he details things about the birth of John the Baptist, who's the cousin of Jesus, and um, um, Matthew, Mark, and John, they never even mentioned this part of the story at all, and then the story goes on uh, in the book of Luke to show Jesus' birth and um, <clears throat> how uh, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. But then he doesn't talk about the, the king's coming. Uh, that's Matthew's job, to talk about the big shots, uh, the important people bringing their expensive gifts of gold and, and frankincense. Uh, that's that's Matthew that does that. But what does Luke do? He goes to the humble shepherds out there, the the normal people, the the regular the regular people out there in the fields, and uh, he has them come to worship the Lord Jesus. He tells that story uh, about Jesus in the manger, and and then he Luke continues to say that Jesus. Um, uh, was obedient to his parents. Uh, that's interesting. Jesus tells, or Luke tells the story of, of Jesus when he was 12 years old, going into the temple. And so uh, the other gospels don't tell those stories at all. And so it's interesting to see that, um, that what Luke shows us about Jesus is hum his humanness, how he gets tired, how he's a, uh, he really is God becoming man. 
So in Luke, Jesus is the Son of God. Well, then we go to the Gospel of John. John, John shows Jesus as the Son of God. Luke shows Jesus as the Son of Man. Luke shows Jesus as the Son of God. There's the eagle there. There's all the different symbols that Ezekiel saw and that are recorded in the book of Revelation. I don't think that any of the uh, gospel writers were trying to coincide, shall we say, with Ezekiel's vision of the lion and the ox, the man and the eagle. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit guided their thoughts. They didn't sit down together to write. They were all separate in writing what they wrote. And, and, yet, um, and yet what they wrote coincided so well with Ezekiel's prophecy. Now, it doesn't mean, for instance, when we see these Gospels, and I break it down this way, that Matthew never shows Jesus as a servant. He does. Jesus is the Son of God in all the Gospels. He's the Son of Man in all the four Gospels and all of that. But each one highlights a different aspect of Jesus. I like the way that Luke opens his gospel uh, because uh, I've learned something about my own life uh, and the call of God on my life. And maybe you can learn a little bit about the call of God on your life. Listen, Listen to the way Luke starts his gospel. He's writing to a friend of his named Theophilus, okay? And um, in fact, Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And when you read the book of Acts, he begins the same, the same way. He says in the book of Acts, I, I wrote before about the things that Jesus began to do and teach. But he says, I'm going to tell you more now. But here's the way Luke starts his gospel. Inasmuch, here's here's what he Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled in us. And he says, um, just as those who from be- the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So Luke, I'm intrigued the way that Luke starts his gospel. When you look at Luke chapter 1, right at the very beginning, he says, um, and I, I was reading it. I guess I was muted while I was reading it. Uh, he's, I, I'll just say it in my own words. He's writing to his friend Theophilus. Luke also wrote the book of Acts and was writing to Theophilus there, adding more to the story. So in this story, Luke is ready to write the story of Jesus, okay? And he said, others have been writing. Uh, they've been eyewitnesses. They've been writing the things that they saw, and and he said, this is verse 3 now, it seemed good to me, I have a perfect understanding of everything that went on, and I would like to sit down and write an orderly account of the story of Jesus. You see, he was a, a doctor, so he wanted everything in an orderly, set out in an orderly way, and he said in verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. He said, I want you to be sure. I want you to really understand this. So here's the thing that caught my attention. He's saying, uh, Theophilus, he's just writing a letter to his friend. And he's saying, um, Theophilus, others have written about Jesus. I know, I've done a lot of research, and I've been there. I've watched. And it just seemed good to me to write to you my story, my eyewitness account of things, my research. And so he writes all this out, which we now know as the Gospel of Luke. And yet I wonder if when Luke wrote that, that he, would re- that he realized then that 2,000 years later, people were still reading it, and this has been known as the Word of God that we use to 
guide our lives. How did it start? It started with a man of God who knew the Lord. It just seemed good to him to write this down. And you know, sometimes we ask, am I in the middle of God's will? And maybe what you're doing now, you're wondering, are you in the middle of God's will? Okay, I'm going to take this off and just continue to, okay, can you see me now? And we say, am I in the middle of God's will? There are things that I have done that I didn't get any great dream or a lightning bolt from heaven, do this. It just seemed good to me that I should do certain things. It just seemed good that I should go to someone. It seemed good that I should take on a project for the Lord. I didn't necessarily always hear God's voice and get a what I call a Damascus Road blast, like Saul did, you know, on the Damascus Road. But it just seems good. And as you walk with God, you will do many things that will just seem good. It'll just seem good. And you will look back on the path you've walked and said, and you'll be able to say, God was leading me. And I didn't really realize that that was God leading me. It just seemed good that I should do it. And I think that is the way that the Lord often orders our steps. Sometimes we get so spiritual that we have to hear God's voice every time. I remember we were having a church picnic. And I asked a young man, he was a very spiritual young man. And I asked him if he would bring some bread to the picnic, some buns. And he said to me, well, I'm going to have to ask God about that. And if God speaks to me, I'll bring bread to the picnic. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you don't have to get a word from God for everything like that. If it just seems good to do, do it. Our steps are ordered by the Lord. And I'm, I'm still not sure whether he ever did bring bread to the picnic or not. But uh, I thought sometimes you, we, we're too spiritual in the sense that we're waiting for something that doesn't have to happen. God leads your life day by day. Some of you are leaders of a group because it just seemed good. That opportunity opened up to you. And it just seemed good for you to step into that position, to help somebody else, to, uh, to guide uh, and help uh, somebody else understand the word or to encourage them as a Christian. It just seemed good for you to do it. And so you did it. And that was God guiding your life. If you are living where God wants you to be, just live every day and do what seems good. And at the end of the day, you're going to realize God has led you in many wonderful, wonderful ways. It just seemed good that I should accept Jocelyn's invitation and teach you. But I'm enjoying doing it. And I think we're in God's will right now. But it didn't start with any great lightning bolt from heaven. It just seemed good that Pastor Carol Ann and Pastor Jocelyn wanted me to share. So I'm doing it. I like living that way. It makes life a whole lot easier. It brings us right down to earth where God directs our steps. God can't direct your steps if your steps aren't on the ground, if you're living up in the clouds somewhere. But when your steps are on the ground, God can direct your steps. Okay, I'm going to stop that one, and I'm going to start something else. And this time, I need you to get into the book that you have, okay, this book that you have here, okay, if you have that, I want you to open it right to the very beginning, to page two, page two, that you've passed the 
indexes and prefaces and all that, and you're going to page two. And page two is like this. It says, eight spiritual reasons why I should study Bible prophecy, okay? The reason I want to do this with you right now is because starting now and next week, we're going to really get into the prophecy part of this study. We're going to, I want to talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk about the rapture and the judgments and, and what's going to happen to the world and Jesus reigning and how the part that we play with uh, in, in all of that. There's a lot of things we're going to study. And then we're going to move on into heaven. And <laughs> oh, that will be a wonderful study. But all of that we call Bible prophecy. There's another word that, um, that we use. It's called uh, eschatology. And eschatology is just a theological word, meaning a study of the end times, okay? A study of the end times. So, some people can't understand why we would even try to get it. I've actually heard some uh, church leaders say, I never get into the book of Revelation. It's just too hard to understand. I've, I've heard them say that. I never talk about end times because there's too many opinions and, and uh, nobody knows for sure. And so I never talk about it. And so some people ignore the study of Bible prophecy entirely. Well, I want you to know that I think it's a very important subject. And so there are many other things I, I love teaching about. As you can see, I've diverted many times. But right now, I want to show you and tell you why it is so important to understand Bible prophecy and why I should study Bible prophecy. And so I have eight reasons here that I want to show you, okay? Number one. And you'll see the reasons there, and you can expand on it if you want on your own notes. Number one, I'm warned. God can always say, I told you so. You know, there are some things that, that happen to us unexpectedly. We say, well, man, I, I, I didn't know that. That caught me totally by surprise. The second coming of Jesus should not catch Christians by surprise. Because Jesus has told us, I'm coming. There is a heaven. There is a hell. Luke chapter 21, verse 24 is in your notes there. But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day with a capital D means that the coming of Jesus, that would it that it would come on you unexpectedly. Uh, See, in other words, it's saying that people who are caught up with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life, the day that Jesus comes is going to catch them unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. So there are many people that are going to be very shocked and surprised. We often say, well, we don't know the we don't know when Jesus is coming. It's a total mystery. Well, it is true that we do know we do not know the day or the hour, but we know the times of the seasons and the and the and the Bible has given us a good warning of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, in verse in the next verse I have under that same point, 1 Thessalonians 5, you brethren and sisters you're not in darkness, so that they that day should overtake you as a thief. This isn't going to surprise us as a thief in the night. No, I'm not surprised. If Jesus should come today, I wouldn't be surprised if he comes today. Why? Because I think all the signs of the time are pointing to the very soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think Jesus is going to come in my lifetime, and I'm already almost 76 years old. Well, 
I think Jesus' second coming is very, very close at hand. Um, and and First John three and verse three, you have that in your notes. It says, "Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself." as he is pure. Look at the word hope. Remember, we talked about hope last week, uh, and uh, hope is a very interesting word. Watch this. I'm not sure that I told you this last week, but I'm going to show you something else. We have the word hope. Uh, hope, H O P E. That's hope. There are four things that hope does to me. It tells me about heaven. Heaven. Hope is about heaven. It tells me what God has prepared for me. Jesus said in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. And I'll go and I'll come again so that I'll take you to where I am. That's heaven. Here is another aspect of hope. It puts obedience. It puts obedience in me. Um, because um, I want to live right. I want to obey the Lord and live for him. I don't want to be caught uh, in sin when Jesus comes. And so because I know what he has prepared, I want to live in obedience. Here's another aspect of hope. Purity. And that's the verse that we just read in 1 John chapter uh, 3 and verse 3. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure in other words i don't want i don't want all the the dirt of sin to be mixed into my life i want to i want my life to be kept pure i want to keep living for the lord the way i ought to be because that is what what uh, uh jesus wants to find when he comes and it's hope that brings me to that point of wanting to be pure. That's what First uh, John chapter 3, verse 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, e, e, of course, you know what that stands for, eternity. Eternity. And that's what hope does. Hope puts heaven in me, obedience in me, purity in me, and eternity in me. I know that this life is not the end. In fact, it's just the beginning. How wonderful to know, and yet how awesome to know that I'm going to live forever. And if I'm going to live forever and ever, I want to live with Jesus forever and ever. The gift of God is what kind of life? Eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How wonderful it is. There's what hope does. H-O-P-E. Heaven, obedience, purity, and eternity. That's the message of hope. Okay, let's go on to number two on your notes, page two. Why should I study Bible prophecy? Because it keeps me on guard. Every step is in the light. That's why uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light. So you see, I, I just want to, I want to, I don't want to walk in darkness. I want to walk in the light of Jesus. I want to be on guard. Uh, there's the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5. Let us who are of the day. You see, we're, we're people of the day. Jesus is the sun that shines on us through the day. 
uh, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and there's a helmet, the hope, there's hope again, of salvation. So uh, let us be sober, it says. Sober means think straight. Stay on guard. Some who is not sober is not thinking straight. Their actions are pretty erratic, and they don't even know what they're doing sometimes. I don't want to walk that way. I want to be calc I want to be on guard. And that's why in Matthew chapter 24, you see, there in your notes, therefore, Jesus said, verse 44, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. When Jesus comes, he wants to find us living for him. Now, there are two words that I want you to circle there in Matthew 24. Be ready. You see those two words? Therefore, Jesus said, be ready. When he comes... He wants us to be ready. Now, there's a difference between be ready and get ready. What's the difference? The difference is if I say, well, I'm going to um, I'm going to um, come to, I'm going to give you a, a phone call right at 10 o'clock tonight. But I, I, can't, I can't make it earlier, and I can't make it later. So when 10 o'clock comes, I want you to have your phone with you, and you be ready for the call. That's being ready. But if you say, if I say 10 o'clock, be ready. But if you think 10 o'clock, get ready, then 10 o'clock comes and you say, okay, I've got to get ready now. Where's my phone? Oh, 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 it's, uh, oh, it's back there. I have to go and somewhere and go. Oh, I have to do something first. I have to brush my hair first. I have to do something else. And you're getting ready. You're not ready. There's a difference between get ready and be ready. You have to get ready before you are ready. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? And so now is the time to be to get ready and to live ready, be ready. So I live in the state of being, being ready. Wow. The word uh, in, in Ephesians that just brings to mind Ephesians 4, it says, be filled with the Spirit. That word be is a simple little word, but it's in, in the Greek, it's, a, it's called a present progressive word. In other words, it's now and continual. It's present and progressive. In other words, it says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not like, okay, I was, I was filled with the Holy Spirit 20 years ago. No, no. Be being filled. Be continually living under the control of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, be ready, he say, be continually living in, be being ready. <laughs> be in the state of readiness all the time for my coming. Okay, number three, page two of your notes, why I should study Bible prophecy. Number three, I am motivated to be faithful and determined. Oh, I want to be faithful. First Corinthians 15. 58 is one of my favorite verses. It's in the back of your book as well. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren. Now, it starts with the word therefore. And I think that's, in, that's important too, because, you know, when you, ever, when you ever see the word therefore in the Bible, it means that something has just been said that leads into this statement. So when you read the word therefore, you want to, you have to find out what it's there for. <laughs> what is the therefore there for? Well, because when you read 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about the fact that we're going to be changed. Our bodies are going to be different. The Lord is coming and he's going to take us to himself. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus and, and what's going to happen in the future. And after having said that, 
we get the word therefore. In other words, since you know this, my beloved brethren, now it goes on. Here it is. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of God, because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's a purpose to life. And because you know what's coming ahead, you can live a faithful life and have purpose and, and, and uh, usefulness in your life. Faithfulness is so important. Being faithful, just can God count on me? I, I just want to say to the Lord, Lord, you can count on me. I, I want to be faithful. I, 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 want, I want you to know that what you see of me today is what I'll be, I'll be tomorrow too. My love for you today isn't going to change tomorrow. I, if anything, it'll grow deeper. That's what faithfulness is. Faithfulness. Verse uh, 2, 1 Corinthians 4. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. In other words, it's not that I'm living for the Lord today and living for myself tomorrow. Every day I'm living for the Lord. One time I was driving my car. And in Canada, we have some big snowstorms, and it was a snowstorm, and it was at nighttime, and it was an, a, a country road. There were no lights. It was dark, and I was driving the car, and my wife was with me and my mother-in-law, and we were driving in this uh, desolate country road. The snow was coming at us, and my lights were shining through the snow onto the road. And all of a sudden, my lights went out, the car lights. There was no, I was totally in the car was still working, but I had no light. And that was a scary thing because we were way far from no, it was freezing cold, snowing, and it was, it was, it could have been very, very dangerous. And I could have even driven off the road because I didn't, I couldn't see the road. I didn't have any lights. And for about three or four seconds, the lights went out. What a feeling it gave me. And all of a sudden, the lights came back on again. And I thought, oh, there's a, there's something that's disconnecting the wires or something. And it was scary. Well, I made it home. But you know what I did the very next day? I went to a garage. I had them look at that, and I had them fix that. I said, I want <coughs> my lights to be faithful. I don't want them to come on only sometimes. I want them on all the time. That's what faithfulness is. Imagine getting into a plane to fly somewhere, and the pilot says, you know, this plane flies most of the time. You, you want it to fly all the time. <coughs> I want to be faithful to the Lord. I want him to be able to count on me. Okay. Number four, another reason why I should study Bible prophecy. I am spurred to win the lost. In other words, a, a spur on a, on a cowboy is a little sharp thing on his heel that, that kind of makes the, makes the horse go, oh, and gets it moving, you know? Well, it gets me moving. I'm spurred to win the lost, to evangelize, to be a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to go to heaven, but I want to take others to heaven with me. I want them to know that Jesus Christ is the only way. Very often when I give people my book, and I've done this even just yesterday, I had a, I had a man from Greece at my house, and I gave him this book. And one thing I said to him, I said, be sure to look at the very last page. It says how to get to heaven. That's an important page. I said, if you don't read anything else in the book, make sure you look at the very last page, how to get to heaven. He said, I will. I'm going to get married this month, and I'm going to take this with my girlfriend, and she's going to be my wife, and we're going to read this together, and I'll read that page, how to get to heaven. I thought, good, praise the Lord. Of course, I had already talked to him about Jesus. And so uh, when when I know what's ahead, I don't want anyone to go to hell because there is a hell as well as a heaven. 
And so I want to tell people about Jesus. And that's why in, in um, Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. Then the end will come. And Jesus said, and you have it in your notes there, Matthew, or, or Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You see, what you're doing there in the Philippines, what you're doing is so important. You're, you're, you're preaching the good news of Jesus. You're telling other people how they can have eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what's the purpose of doing it? Why would you even do that? Because you know something about the future. You know something about Bible prophecy. And you know that they need to hear this story of salvation. And so I'm spurred to win the lost. The more I understand Bible prophecy, the more I want to share this good news with others. Number five. I am, in, this is another reason to study Bible prophecy. I'm impacted to love the family of God. Imagine that. It says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, let us consider one another. Um, there's a, the old, um, the old uh, King James version of that says, let us provoke one another to love and good deeds. Well, sometimes all we do is provoke one another, you know, but uh, we're not, that means stir up uh, uh, goodness in somebody else. Be an encourager. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So I'm helping somebody else become a stronger Christian. That's what you're doing. You're taking what you know of the word of God and of what God has shown you and the love of Jesus in your heart. You take that and you share it with somebody else. And even other brothers and sisters in the Lord, you put their, your arm around them and you say, it's okay, you know, let's be encouraged. I want to encourage you. I want to have the ministry of encouragement to let you know that even though you're going through a trial right now, Jesus is watching over you. And he's got some good things ahead. And the Bible tells us that the sufferings of this present time are to be compared with the glory this isn't the, I often say to people when they're going through a problem, this isn't the last chapter. That's a word of encouragement. It's not the last chapter. How do I know that? Well, Bible prophecy. It's because I've studied Bible prophecy and I know there's some good things ahead. So even with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, you see, number five, it, we're reading Hebrews chapter 10. Let's consider one another. This is in the family of God, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, some don't bother with church, but exhorting one another, it's lifting, you know, building them up, and so much more as you see the day approaching. I like that word exhorting, encouraging, building up. You know, we have... Um, uh, have you seen a, a pump for a bicycle? You know, a bicycle wheel, uh, a tire, and the air goes out of it. And so you get a pump. You, you must have them. And you, and you pump it, and the air goes up in the tire of the, uh, of the bicycle, and it's ready to roll on again. That's, that's a pump. And, it, you know, there are pumps in the family of God. And I want to be a pump. I want to pump you up and build you up. And so what you feel good about what Jesus has done for you and you walk out, ah, that's good. That's being a pump. But you know what I've also discovered? That there are pins in the family of God too. You get the, um, the balloon that's all filled and someone comes up with a pin and says, boom, you're not so great. I didn't think that was so wonderful. Bang. And they stick a pin in you and out goes the air and you think oh wow i don't want to be a pin i want to be a pump in the family of god i've had uh, i've had people that are pins that have come to me and i just shake my head i say okay i'll tell you one story 
I'll tell you that this is interesting. I, I don't tell everybody this, but I was preaching one day in my church and there was a visiting pastor there. And the visiting pastor, I had never met him before. And he was only there that one service and sitting in church. And he came to me after and met me in the lobby of the church to shake my hand. And you know what? He, I can tell you exactly what he said to me. He said to me, I heard that you were a pretty good preacher, but you sure blew it this morning, didn't you? That's what he said. In other words, you sure didn't do very well today, did you? I would consider him a pin, not a pump, eh? <laughs> I thought, why would he say that to me? He just wanted to put me down. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, I just laughed. I just, but he meant it. He was serious. And I thought, why go around telling people how bad they are? Why not be a pump instead of a pin and point out some of the good things about them and encourage them? And that's why the Bible says we need to encourage one another. And then what it says at the very end of that verse in, um, in um, that I have on page two, number five, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see that? In other words, it's because you know Jesus is coming back. You want to be encouraging one another, building them up in the faith. The day of Jesus coming is approaching. And so I want to live for him and I want to encourage others. Okay, number six, page two. Why should I study Bible prophecy? I am comforted regardless of pain or danger. Wow. And that's why um, when we talk about the second coming, that is actually uh, a comforting thing. First Thessalonians 4, which is talking about the, the dead in Christ rising and Jesus coming back. And it ends, it says, therefore, there's that word therefore again. And when you ever see the word therefore, you want to know what it's there for. And so, and so we see, it says, therefore, since you know Jesus is coming again, comfort one another with these words. I had someone say to me, I don't, I don't like studying prophecy because it scares me. Well, the Bible doesn't say scare one another with these words. It says comfort one another with these words. It doesn't, it's not to bring fright to us. It's to bring comfort to us. And so uh, I uh, look at the next verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. See, that brings comfort to me. I, I think, wow, what I'm going through now, maybe you're going through a really difficult time right now yourself, but you can know for sure that this is not the last chapter. Whatever pain you're going through, God's going, not going to leave you in that pain. And you can even discover that God has some purpose in that. And things are going to be even better in the days ahead. In fact, it's going to be so much better that Romans says the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared to what God has for us. That's wonderful. And so that's another good reason for studying Bible prophecy. Number seven, I am filled with hope and eager anticipation. Do you know what? I remember as a kid, my parents would say, you know what? If you work hard at school this week, and on Saturday, when school's off, we're going to go for a picnic, a family picnic. And we'd say, oh, good. And all through the week, we're going for a picnic on Saturday, and we're going to the lake, and we're going to go swimming, and we're going to have a good time. And what I was doing, I was anticipating a good time. And I plowed through the work at school, and I was so excited. I would tell my friends, we're going on a picnic this Saturday. It was eagerness, anticipation. That's, that's what hope does. I always have said, you know, when, when we say, I can hardly wait to go on a picnic. I've always said that in life, 
we all need some, I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait for Monday to come so that we can sit together and study God's word. I can hardly wait for Wednesday because something good's going to end. And you've got things planned and you can say, I can hardly wait. Well, when we know Jesus is coming back, I can hardly wait for his coming. I'm so excited. The fact that Jesus is coming. Um, and in verse, uh, I've, I've given a, a verse from the New Living Testament on, under number seven, Romans 8, verse 23. It says, we believers wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full ra uh, rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies that he has promised us. Ah, I'm filled with hope and eager anticipation, knowing what the Lord has shown me in Bible prophecy. And then the last reason for studying Bible prophecy is number eight. I am better able to understand the world I'm living in, current events. When I hear things that are happening in the world, when I hear trouble, when I hear of wars, when I hear of ungodly people doing bad things, um, I, I, I'm understanding that because the Lord said two things are going to happen in the last days. And we'll study this more next week. Two things are going to happen parallel. It's going to be really bad and it's going to be really good. There's an English writer named Charles Dickens who wrote a lot of different books. And maybe you've seen some of his books, but uh, he's written books like uh, um, Christmas Carol or Scrooge or, or David Copperfield and things like that. But he wrote a book um, called The Tale of Two Cities. And, and it begins this way. Um, it begins, the very first chapter begins this way. It was the best of times it was the worst of times. Everything was great. Everything was terrible. And, and he goes on with a whole paragraph of great contrasts, and it looks like total opposites. And that's the way he starts the book. And he's talking about the tale of two cities. Well, I looked at that book, and I think that's kind of the world we're living in. Do you know what? This is the best of times. But it's also the worst of times. The best of times, God said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so there's going to be, and I believe there is happening right now. And you in the Philippines are helping make this happen. You're helping the word of God spread. And this is the best of times. More people are coming to the gospel of Jesus. More people are coming to Jesus in the Philippines now than have ever come in history. There's work being done, and you're part of God's workers that are doing an, a marvelous thing. And these, this is the best of times. And I commend you, and I say, keep up the good work. But it's also the worst of times. This world is so evil, so wicked. I watch the news, things that are happening in America. In America, it is just turmoil. People are being killed. Laws are being passed that are godless, that are leaving God out of it. And I'm thinking, this America is in trouble. And the world is in trouble, a lot of the world. And I'm thinking, this is the worst of times. It couldn't be worse. Well, it's getting worse. And there's wars and rumors of war, terrible things going on in the world. Best of times. And yet, when I see all of that, I realize that's what God said would happen. And so I'm better, you see, that's another reason to study. I'm better able to understand current events, the things that are happening. See the verses that I have for you there in Matthew 24. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, these, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things have taken place. So Jesus is warning us and he's telling us, you're going to see 
certain things going on in the world. But I'm telling you, when you understand my plan, you can rest in, in, my, uh, in my word. And Luke 21, verse 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. It's almost like the 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 world events are gaining speed. It's, it's like they're going down a hill or something. They're going faster and faster. And so I know that we are getting very, very close to the second coming of Jesus. Next week, I want to talk about the second coming, about the rapture of the church, about how what's going to happen when Jesus actually comes to take us, how we will be changed, and what will happen beyond that to us and to this world. But I know from reading the Bible and looking at the world around me that Jesus is coming soon. Know this, says 2 Timothy chapter 3, again, it's in your notes there, that in the last days, perilous times will come. It's true. That's what's happening. Jesus said in Matthew 16, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. In other words, if you can look at the sky and say, you know, it's going to rain soon. <laughs> we can look at Bible prophets and say, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Okay, and in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6, he said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. Don't worry. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilence, earthquakes. You see, the Lord's told us all these things. And when I see these things happen, I realize that's exactly what God said would happen. And so I'm able to see some people see it happening and they say, I don't understand. Where's God and all this? Well, I don't have to ask those kind of questions. I say, you know what? God told us it would happen. But he also told us that we could walk with him. One last verse, and then I'm going to leave you. In Matthew chapter, uh, uh, in the Beatitudes that uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus gave, he said, um, he said, let me find it here. Um, uh, hang on here. He said, um, take my yoke upon you. Where am I here? And learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me. There's that word come. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And... Uh, you will find rest for your souls. Uh, when we come to Jesus, just a second now, hang on. I, I want to say this right here. It's, in, it's, not in, in, um, it's, in, it's not in the Beatitudes. It's in Matthew chapter 11. Okay, there it is. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. There's that word rest. And so when I come to the end of this study, I, I want my spirit to be at rest in Jesus. And uh, the work that I do for Jesus, I want to do it out of a heart of relaxation and rest, not, oh, I'm, I've got to do this. And Jesus says, just be cool. Find rest. See, verse 29 in Matthew 11, he said, you will find rest to your souls. And then he says, verse uh, 30, Matthew 11. Matthew 11 and verse 30. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, I like those three verses. Matthew chapter 11, 28, 29, and 30. He said, take my yoke. You know what a yoke is? A yoke is what, it's, it's what they tie animals together by a yoke. Two oxen would be 
teamed together as a team by putting a yoke around the, their, both of their necks. And so they work together as a team. Well, when we take a yoke with Jesus, it means we're teamed up with Jesus. He's the other half of the team. But I remember as a child helping, helping my father in the garden, and he had a wheelbarrow, you know? And a wheelbarrow has these two handles on it and a wheel at the front, and you put all this heavy dirt in the, in the box, and then he can wheel it to somewhere else. And he would let me help him wheel the wheelbarrow. So he'd lift it up and I'd get between, I'd, I'd get uh, in front of him and I'd be helping him. Do you know what? I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything really. He was doing all the carrying, but I thought I was helping him. Be, and he let me because it made me feel pretty good that I was helping my father. But the bottom line was he was doing all the work. You see, when I team up with Jesus, he's the one that's doing all the work. He takes the weight. I am just yoked with him. I'm teamed with him. That's why he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And in verse 30, my yoke is easy. Do you know what the word easy means? It means it fits well. It fits well. What God has called you to do, he's not going to, call, going to call you to do something that's impossible for you. He's not going to call you to do something that some great world leader does or great well-known evangelist or something. He wants you to be you, and he wants you to do what he's called you to do because that is you. And he knows your abilities, what you can do. He knows what you can't do. And so what he's called you to do fits well. Let me show an, an illustration before we go. I have down here a sweater. This is my wife's sweater. She doesn't know I have it, but I snuck it out of her closet. And here's my wife's sweater. And what if I try to put on my wife's sweater? Okay. I'm trying to put it on, and here it is. Oh, this doesn't fit. I can't. I can't get into this. It's her sweater. It doesn't fit me at all. It fits her perfectly, but look at look at how short it is in the sleeve. It does not fit me. I'm taking it off. But I have my own sweater. Here's my sweater. You see this? I can put it on really easily. There you are. Do you know why? Because this fits well. It fits well. And Jesus said, what I've called you to do isn't awkward for you. It's not for somebody else. I'm not calling you to be like anybody else. I want you to be you. And what I've asked you to do fits well to you. You can do things that Sister Jocelyn cannot do. Don't try to be her. You be you. Because you can do things that Sister Jocelyn can't do. I know she can do almost anything, but... <laughs> I'm teasing you. Uh, but what I'm saying is that God just wants you to use the talents he's given you and the abilities he's given you to do his work. That's why he said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light and you'll find rest to your souls. You know, it's one thing to have rest in our bodies. We can go to bed and have a sleep and get rest in our bodies. But sometimes our body, our soul isn't at rest. And even when our body is at rest, our soul is all turning and, and everything's still up, uh, you know, upset. God says, no, you'll find rest to your souls as well. Inside, you can find my peace. And in the middle of life's storms, you can have my peace. One last story, okay? I'll tell you more, one story. I'm taking off my sweater because it's too warm. 
I heard about a man who was in an art gallery and he was going through the art gallery and looking at all the different paintings and everything that were there in the art gallery. <clears throat> he came across this one painting that the artist had done and it was, it was not a landscape, it was a seascape. In other words, it was of water. And it was uh, uh, the, the way the artist had drawn uh, the, or had painted it, you could tell that it was a storm that he was painting. The sky was dark, the, the waves were, were high, you could see that they had been splashing upon the rock. The, there was a, a big cliff, a rock cliff on the shore, and the waves were splashing. You could see the splashes of the, of the water off the rock cliff and, uh, and the darkness of the storm. And it was an excellent painting of a terrible storm at sea. But the strange thing was he looked at the title under the picture, there was a little plaque there, and the title was called Peace. And he looked at it and he said, that is a strange title for such a painting. It's, it's anything but peace. There's a big storm there. And I don't know. And so he stood there and a man who worked at the art museum came up and he said, do you like that painting? He said, it's an amazing painting, but he said, I don't understand the title. He said, look, look, look at the uh, storm and it's obviously not peaceful. And the man who worked at the library said, oh, he said, you didn't look close enough. You didn't look closely enough at the painting. He said, look again, uh, look over at the rock cliff. You see inside there's a, a little cavity in that rock cliff. And you see, you see a little bird in there? There's a little bird in there. And you see, that artist has made the bird look like he's singing. He's not worried about the storm because he's sheltered in the cleft of the rock. And that bird is totally at peace, even in the midst of the storm. And I thought that is exactly the way it is with my relationship with Jesus. I can, there, there are storms that come in our lives, but I can be at peace in the storm. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. You'll find rest for your souls, said Jesus. And I'm so glad for the peace that I have in Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 14, Remember now, I'm going to study, I'm going to take you into heaven, and we're going to study Bible prophecy next week. But one of my favorite verses about heaven is in John 14, where Jesus is saying, In my father's houses are many, in my father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. But you know, the first thing he said before he said that, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ah. Let not your heart, don't let your heart be troubled. He said, and we, we're, we, we're going to study it more next week, that there's unrest and pandemonium and wars and all kinds, but I don't need to let my heart be troubled. And in that same chapter in John 14, verse 27, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. The world doesn't have this kind of peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And so I end with that note. Rest in Jesus. Hide yourself in the cleft of the rock, Jesus Christ. And you can be like that little bird and just sing in the middle of the storm. Because God has promised he'll never leave you or forsake you. And the Lord is my shelter in the time of storm. God bless you, dear ones. It's been really nice and wonderful to be with you again this evening. And I hope that uh, some of the things you've said are able to, or I've said that uh, are, you're able to meditate on and think about some more and put your head on the pillow tonight and say, Jesus, I am not just resting my body. I'm resting my soul in the cleft of the rock, Jesus Christ.
Amen? Amen. Jocelyn, I give it back to you. Pastor Carol, amen. That was another um, very rich uh -huh. teaching tonight. Amen, yes. Oh my, we really covered a lot tonight, Pastor Craig. Wow. So thankful to the Lord. Oh, and, uh, I wow. hope it wasn't too much. Um, no, I think it was okay. Oh, goodness. Even just the four Gospels. You know, I learned a lot that I think I never heard oh, or maybe good. never realized before. Thank you so much. And even, you know, the comparison of Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. I mean, good. like, wow. The two mountains. Well, praise the, the Lord. There's mountains. lots to see. Now, next week, I'm going to try to stay on topic, and I'm going to just, uh, it's, it's hard for me, and especially with you, because you, you, you pull it out of me, and uh, that's, it's your fault, not mine, okay? Uh, so, uh, but next week, we're going to talk about the second coming, about the way the world will be before Jesus comes, and the rapture, and uh, all that. So, get ready. Uh, we're we're going to have a really interesting time next week. Yes, we're so excited. Actually, um, I, I I just read a tech, uh, a, a, a chat uh, to, uh, that was sent to me privately and said, I can't wait for next week. <laughs> and well, there, there's some I can now. hardly wait. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I hope, uh, you know, being ready and be ready. I hope we are all ready. There's a difference, wow. isn't there? Good. Be Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God Carol? bless you. Excellent morning again. Thank you, Pastor Craig. Uh, I saw, I can't remember who it was, somebody posted this week that um, they enjoy their their Mondays with you so much that they want them to be longer. <laughs> oh. oh, dear. So I don't think you're packing too much in if, if they want it to be longer and uh, and just learn more. I think that this has been just an awesome awesome study thank you for walking us through this uh and i realize that there are some that are um uh, that are with us that it's more than just one person on the other side i see uh, a pastor abedningo sharon and laura i i see all of you there and i greet you from canada god bless you uh and oh so many others that yeah there's just... four of them actually there there's four of them. Okay. I can't see them all, but uh, God yeah, bless so you. we we had um 42, I wrote it 42 people or 42 um accounts logged on, and some of them have several people. So we've got probably close to 60 people, do you think, Jocelyn, today? Okay. Yes, I think so oh, and uh, also one of our uh, coordinator here is having a meeting and there's a lot of them and uh, he sent a picture and I can tell there's several of them here. My goodness, yeah, like, I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's a little yeah. foggy. It's not clear. Oh, okay, sorry. It's, there's so many of them in here and <laughs> Uh, they're having a meeting and so he just turned on pastor jess are you still there and still listening to to you <laughs> amazing that's wonderful and, that's so yeah, great I can't miss it pastor craig praise the lord back to you pastor carol okay well i think we'll just we'll close in prayer jocelyn is there someone you would like to uh, call on this morning who could close us out in prayer today yes i think i would like to call on um grace Yi. grace you can pray in chinese and we can agree <laughs> wonderful <with you. laughs> yes. god knows all the languages there's <laughs> no respect for <laughs> language no <laughs> nothing grace. like putting your friend on the spot there jocelyn <laughs> Grace, uh, someone said to me, what language will we speak in heaven? And uh, 
someone said, I think it'll be Chinese. And I said, <laughs> why? They said, because it's going to take all eternity to learn how to speak it. <laughs> <laughs> and write it. I hear it, yeah. it looks very hard to write, too. <laughs> So let me speak okay. language in heaven. <laughs> okay. okay, well, let's pray. Me? Yes, Grace. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, yes, you can pray in Chinese. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, let you uh, listen to... Uh, some language in heaven, okay? <laughs> uh, 亲爱的天父, 谢谢你, 谢谢你今天晚上有这样的非常美妙的信息, 让我们透过牧师给我们这样的分享, 感谢赞美你, 主啊, 是的, 我们自己的, 我自己也感觉在这当中得到了很大的祝福, 有很多的看见, 有很多属灵的看见, 也有很生命当中也得到了很多的激励, 谢谢你祝福我们今天晚上的时光，也谢谢你继续的使用牧师来祝福我们下一节课。感谢赞美你，听我们这样的祷告，奉主耶稣基督的圣名。In Jesus name, Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> That's good. God bless you, dear ones. Thank you for joining us today. For more information on our ministries, please visit my website at inthewaitingministries.com. I'd invite you to also check out my YouTube channel, and I'm also on Facebook at In The Waiting Ministry.